everyone, welcome back to Castle Goring with Chatting with Lady C. Hello, Georgie. Hello, Leo. How you been? I've been very well, as you know, only too well because you saw me two minutes ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we are rocking with our with the announcement of your new book, so it's getting all good for you well, as well. That's nice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let's start with the first question. Uh -huh. So it's uh, related with Diana. So, yes. did you have any respect for Diana's plight in that she clearly had abandonment issues from her childhood? That's a very interesting question. I had a lot of sympathy for Diana's plight. I don't think she only had abandonment issues. I think she was seriously traumatized by the antagonism of her parents uh, because her father divorced her mother for adultery, but the mother tried to divorce the father for cruelty. And her mother's own mother testified against her, which was actually a terrible thing to do because Francis was in the right, but Ruth, her mother, was such an insuperable snob that she decided there was no way she was going to allow her daughter to decamp and take the children with her. Because Ruth, who was a terrible snob and an arch royalist, understood that if the children were brought up within the royal fold, that they would have royal lives. Well, if they were brought up outside of the royal fold, they would most likely not. So she rarely, for purely snobbish reasons, betrayed her daughter's interests. Well, Francis never forgave her mother. This completely traumatized Diana. And when Diana's marriage had failed and she wanted to leave, her great terror, and it was more than just a fear, it was a terror, that her children would be taken after, sorry, that her children would be taken away from her and what had been done to her mother would be done to her as well. And Diana did everything to prevent this from happening. You could not convince Diana that it was not a valid fear, that it was a residue of her childhood, but it was a fear of hers. And yes, I had a tremendous amount of sympathy for her insofar as that was concerned. You can have sympathy for someone and understand why they're doing something, but not agree with all that they are doing. And I certainly did not agree with a lot of what Diana did. Diana was not the only person who was in a difficult position. I was in a difficult position many times, not only while I was growing up, but once I had grown up. There is an honourable and decent way of going about things, and there is the other way. Diana did not always take the high road. She played hardball and sometimes dirty ball. Well, my experience of life has been play, play it cleanly and ultimately even if it takes a bit longer and even if it's a little bit more difficult and even if you end up having a harder time in the short term, in the long term you do yourself many greater favours by taking the high road. And I speak from experience. Uh, I felt down and made a complete hash of it at certain times. <laughs> and, you know, it's not for me, though, to walk in anybody else's shoes. Each of us has our own path and each of us has our own shoes that we have to walk in. And whether you make a mistake or do the right thing, you pay the price. Everything in life has a consequence. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it always has a consequence. When my children were young, I used to say to them, you may as well be brave and you may as well do the decent thing. 
because life is full of unexpected consequences. So there's no merit in being a coward and there's no merit in doing the wrong thing because not only are you going to experience what you expect, but somehow, somewhere along the line, the action you take will have unexpected results as well. And I think it's true. That's been my experience of life. Did you admire uh, Princess of Wales's uh, professional work, even though she suffered in her personal life? Well, we all suffer in our personal life. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. We all do. Uh, you suffering have, as well. Everybody I suffers. I have new hairstyle, thanks to lockdown. <laughs> oh, my God. That is torment, Leo. Torment. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for me, please. <laughs> torment. My God. I hope I look good. <laughs> well, I think you should attempt what? suicide. No, at least no. gently. <laughs> <laughs> you can help me. <laughs> You will assist me. <laughs> we'll go on to the ramparts and maybe, maybe you'll try to be Simon the Sorcerer and fly like a bird. <laughs> no, fun and joke aside, I'm being quite serious. Oh. Okay, yes. Everybody suffers. And I have to tell you, the suffering of a Princess of Wales no matter how much she wishes to dramatize it, mm -hmm. does not equate to the suffering of a poor, penniless woman with children to feed and a husband to take care of, or a lover or whatever, and very little money. It, the suffering does not equate. And I think we need to bear that in mind when we are speaking about the suffering of the privileged or the overprivileged. That is not to take away the fact that they do suffer. But sometimes if you have a little bit less in life and you have to strive for a little bit more, you will actually end up suffering a lot less. But so I would not say that I did not sympathize with her suffering, but I did not dramatize it the way she dramatized it. That's one thing. Her, her humanitarian work, I thought was very good. She met Mother Teresa through a friend of mine, Peter Ripley, who is a very well-known figure in the charity world. Peter used to be the head of the United Nations Association Charity Fundraising Committee, which I was on the, uh, I was a member of that committee for many years from the late 70s. Uh, and Peter is the one who connected Diana with Mother Teresa. And this gave Diana a whole new dimension which was a very positive thing. Uh, Diana did do some wonderful things in terms of her charity work, but she also got an awful lot of credit where credit was not due. Mm. You know, Harry and William have said that their mother is the person who was the very first royal who was involved with AIDS. That is completely untrue. They believe the lie because it's been repeated so often. Princess Margaret was the very first royal to be involved with AIDS. Princess Margaret used to go to the lighthouse. She was not touchy-feely with anybody, but she used to go and she used to sit and speak to and comfort this was years before Diana did it, incidentally. This was in the mid-80s. So I'm not trying to take away from what Diana did, because what she did was commendable, and it was a good thing for her to do. But we need to place it all in its context. There was much hysteria surrounding Diana always. A part of it was because she loved the attention and she attracted it to herself. And when she wasn't getting it, she manipulated the situation so that she would get attention and she would go out of her way to steal attention from the other royals. Well, the public 
not knowing about all of this, would look at her and think, oh, isn't she wonderful? And the rest of them are, where are they? What are they doing? <laughs> well, half the time they've been doing it before. You know, Diana, there's very little that Diana did except for taking off her tights and stooping to receive bouquets from little girls that the other royals had not done before. She simply did it in a way that the press was able to tell the public that Diana was breaking new ground. And yeah, she broke a little bit of new ground, but she broke a lot less new ground than she has been given credit for. And she snatched a lot of the credit from the others who deserved it. Okay. Next question, Next please, question. Leo. Don't be so uh, <laughs> excited. <laughs> okay, so I have read your book um, about narcissism. Yes. Yes. So um, I could see a lot of parallels, parallels between Diana's narcissi narcissistic behavior mm -hmm. and Megan's. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, is it because of your early experience with the narcissism that you had um, so early go? on Megan? Well, before Megan came on the scene, I wrote a book called Daughter of Narcissus, which is a study of narcissistic personality disorder. I wrote it at the behest of Dr. Erica Freeman, who is one of the most eminent psychoanalysts in the world. People don't need to take my word for that. They can look her up for themselves. Erica recommended that I write the book because she knew that I had survived a narcissistic mother and that I had not only survived her, but I had survived her well and healthily and that I had flourished despite her. Narcissists devour their young. They devour everybody in their path. And it is quite a difficulty to become your own person and find your footing in the world at large once you have been devoured by a narcissist. Because of mummy's behaviour, I was on to Diana's behaviour quite early on because I saw parallels between the two of them once I was writing my first Diana book. Diana and Mummy would do some of the exact same things. There were times when it was really freaky. They would use a tone of voice, a tilt of the head, and you knew you were being manipulated, and you knew you were being maneuvered. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's Mummy all over again. So I was on to Diana quite early because of mummy. Well, I have not ever said that I thought that Megan was a narcissist. I know that many other people have accused her of being a narcissist. I have not ever actually said that she is a narcissist. What I did say to Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain was that when he was describing her behaviour of, I said, well, it is classical narcissistic behaviour, adoration, denigration, discard, which it is. It's one of the classics of narcissistic behaviour. And Piers alighted upon that since when a lot of other people have alighted upon it. But I have not actually particularly put in my awe or said anything to the effect that I regard Meghan Markle as a narcissist. But you know, we live in a relatively sophisticated world and people out there see a lot of TV, they look at a lot of television programs on all sorts of interesting things. You know, they read books. They're not exactly dumb. 
the general public is a, I have always thought is a lot more intelligent than they are given credit for being. I know that's not a very fashionable attitude to have, and I know that many members of the press and many writers and indeed many politicians think that most people are stupid. I don't think most people are that stupid, I've got news for you. I think, and I think also even stupid people have a nose for the truth. So, uh, I do not discount the opinions of people once they are arrived at on the basis of solid evidence. And my understanding of what has happened with Meghan Markle and her reputation is that the public have seen her behavior and concluded that she is a narcissist. That's not quite the same thing as my having said she's a narcissist. Yes. But you know, the person who asked about my knowledge of narcissism, well, I mean, the fact that Erica Freeman, of all people, Mickey, <laughs> oh, Mickey, darling, yes, you've come to see your naughty. Okay, yes. The fact that Erica Freeman, of all people, uh, felt able to recommend to me that I write the book, was I, I was extremely honored that she, of all people, because she really is one of the most eminent psychoanalysts in the world, and I was very honored that she suggested I write it. And I have got many over the years, many, many really touching letters from people who have read the book and who were moved by the book and who the book affected in a very positive way. Because you see the problem with dealing with a narcissist is that when you're a part of their game, you half the time really have no idea what's going on because they can be very charming and loving and captivating and then they are blow, they blow hot and cold. They wrong foot you at practically every turn. And as soon as you're about to come to a conclusion based on the reality of what they are, they reel you back in by doing something to fox you so that you will believe that what the conclusion you were coming to is an erroneous conclusion, when in fact it was the accurate conclusion. And the only reason why I was able to be free of my mother and to come to the conclusions that I did was that my mother's behavior was so bad. I mean, my mother tried to burn me on my face when I was 22 years old because Susie Knickerbocker in the American papers had said that I was one of the most beautiful girls in the world and my mother went ape when she was told about this. Oh. You would have thought she'd have been pleased. Yes. I looked somewhat like my mother but I was 22 years younger than my mother. And, as, and the thing about a narcissist is there's only room for one person to breathe oxygen, and it's them. They're the only person who's entitled to attention. They're the only person who's entitled to anything, and they call the shots. And that, that one newspaper comment is what precipitated my mother trying to burn me on my face, age 22. And it destroyed my relationship with her. It took me years to realize that she actually killed the relationship. I didn't realize for years that she'd killed it. There, there were long stretches when I refused to speak to her. But again, we kept all of this private because it was unseemly for me to be rubbishing my mother while she was alive. So I never said anything to anybody. Uh, but when she was dead, Erica said to me, you know, you've survived this so well. 
uh, and yours, you will make a contribution because at the time there was no book out there written by a survivor of narcissistic personality disorder who had gone on to be an intact, happy, successful, well-adjusted, whatever word you want to use, human being. So that's really how I came to write it. And I did not want to write it. I had to be talked into it by Erica. And I also got my sister's approval. I asked both my sisters because it wasn't only my mother, it was their mother as well. And, you know, we are from a very prominent family. And I did not want to dishonor my mother without my sisters understanding what I was going to be doing. And I asked them for their consent to go ahead. And they both said I should go ahead. Uh, afterwards, one of my sisters was not so crazy about the fact that I'd done it and said, but you spoke the truth. I said, well, of course I was going to speak the truth. What else was I going to do? <laughs> if you write a book like this, you have to speak the truth. Yes. I don't think she realized that I was actually going to just speak the truth. I think she thought, oh, well, you know, she'll dress it up nicely. Well, there's no point in dressing things like that up nicely. The truth is the truth. And also, of course, if you're a writer and you have any regard for your readership, you need to speak the truth. So that's how I came to write it. And that's also how I came to be on to all sorts of narcissists, because narcissism proliferates in the upper classes and it also proliferates in the ambitious classes you know middle class girls who are or boys who are ambitious and have something going for them and have an overinflated opinion of themselves or uh, they are narcissistic as well and don't misunderstand me most successful people and most well-adjusted people have some attributes of narcissism. Narcissism is a healthy ego run riot to become an unhealthy thing. But there's much that a narcissist has that is actually positive in small doses. The problem is they are rampant and they are completely you know, self-centered and it's all about them. We're slightly sidetracked on all of this because I actually do not think that Diana was a classical narcissist. Diana had narcissistic elements to her personality that most high-profile successful people have. But my actual analysis of Diana's conduct, what she said, what she did, how she interacted with people, myself included, all the evidence pointed to me to the fact that Diana was not a classical narcissist, but that Diana did have serious underlying personality and emotional issues. Uh, Diana, if anything, was more hovering on borderline than narcissism. And what happens with people who are, whose personality is slightly damaged in some way is that you have a primary problem with secondary aspects of other problems. So, for instance, you'll find that a narcissist usually has sociopathic tendencies and might self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. So the drug addiction and alcoholism become a part of the package. It's called a cocktail personality. Most of these people have a cocktail of of they have a cocktail of symptoms but just to be absolutely clear about it all in my opinion diana was not a classical narcissist yes of 
course. <laughs> of course. Um, so we have many requests uh, regarding your book about Harry and Meghan from the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, uh, I don't know which other countries very internationally, yeah. Canada. Mm -hmm. So um, the people trying to pre-order your book there. So. Jamaica, Jamaica, let's not forget no, Jamaica. In Jamaica. <laughs> I've got comments from Jamaica as well. We need to remember, remember yes, little yes, Jamaica. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when they will be able to pre-order your book? Well, at the moment, we have uh, a deal with an American publisher and they are in the process of doing whatever they are doing. And it, they will tell us when they're going to do it before they do it. But they need to, I'm not quite sure how these things work because I'm not, you know, I'm a writer, I'm not in the production of books, mm -hmm. but it's, there's a process and it takes time. And the American process, which is Amazon International, is really Amazon.com, which yes. is America. So until Ameri the American publisher has his ducks in a row and decides when he wants to post it, on Amazon.com, I'm afraid people, we have to ask people's indulgence and they wait yes. because there's, it's, there's no way around it unless you get somebody to buy the book in England. It's already been translated into various other countries of, or other foreign languages and unless you buy one of those or get it in England. It's just it's it's patient, but it's it's not going to take that long. No. It's a matter of a few weeks. Okay, you know, so people just have to wait a few weeks. Yeah, we will announce. When, yeah. So yeah. don't worry, we will announce when the book will be ready. It will be very soon. <laughs> <laughs> people can't wait. <laughs> They're very excited. Well, it's nice. Oh, Mickey, yes, yes darling, yes, mommy loves you too. Oh, yes. <laughs> So, the next thing is very interesting, what I think uh, you would like to share with everyone. Well, I wouldn't like to share it, but I honor requires that I yes, share Yes, you are requested. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Omid, uh, Omid Scooby um, approached your team. Yes. So, can you tell us more what yes. happened about this? Yes, well... Omid Scoby approached my team and asked that we delete from last week's video the statement that he is that he was Marcus Anderson's boyfriend. Okay. Well, as you will know, we tried to do it, but it would have damaged the video. As you will know. We tried to edit it and it was virtually impossible to do without damaging the video. So I thought about this and I thought, well, you know, Omid Scoby is a writer. He's a jobbing or a writer. He's a jobbing journalist. Uh, the research that you have done shows me that, in fact, he has extensive connections in uh, the the press and the tabloids and uh, magazines. Mm -hmm. He's bazaars this, he's good morning America's that. Why he is asking me to do X, Y, Z, A, B, and C, when in fact he has such connections is quite beyond me, but I'm happy to oblige. If he says he and Marcus Anderson were never boyfriends, that's fine by me. I'm prepared to, to say that he was not, uh, that, that he has told me he was not. Is it that odd that he requested this from us, I mean, from you to do it? Oh, well, of course it's very odd. I mean, you know, why is he basically, uh, why has, hasn't this been done by him? and his extensive network, because I gather from what you research you have done, 
uh, that he has an ex- and heard from my friends. Yeah. Yes, that he has an extensive network of press connections. Uh, none of whom has managed to do this. I mean, but you know, I'm happy to be manipulated as long as I feel that what is being asked of me is not dishonorable and you know but the whole thing really is <laughs> really rather silly quite frankly you know i mean why i of all people should be put in the position of having to clean up uh only scobie's reputation quite quite surprises me but i'm happy to do it you know he's a young man he's making his way in the world I have nothing against Omid Scobie personally. Good luck to him. You know, he's obviously very capable at what he does because he's all over everywhere, it turns out. Uh, gratis Megan and his friendship in quotes with Megan. Uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, in the last two days, he's posted endless stuff about Megan from Megan. Uh, but why? And maybe he's he knows. Maybe he's heard that I'm decent and honourable, and that if he approaches me, I will play ball, which I will. I'm happy to play ball uh, because I don't think it's anything untoward in this regard. But I do find it incredible that. I'm the person who's having to defend only Scobie's supposed reputation, which good luck to him, you know. But I also think it's actually slightly ironic and maybe even funny that I'm put in this position. Oh, life is full of strange things, you know. Let's just rock and roll with something else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So the, the other question was as well regarding your new book. So what is your opinion? Why um, Prince Harry and Meghan choose these two journalists to write their book, uh, I mean, their biography and not you? <laughs> that really was a question. Yes. God forbid. <laughs> Make it did you hear that? Gosh. Well, because people respect you and they know that you have, you know, credibility, experience, knowledge. Well, that's precisely why and Harry everything. and Meghan wouldn't have had the temerity to ask yes. me yes. to write a panegyric about them. Yes. You know, I don't, I'm not a minister of propaganda. My name is Georgia Ariana Campbell, not Yosef or Josefa Goebbels. I do not do propaganda, well, never did, and I'm not going to start at my age. I leave that up to jobbing journalists. Let them do it, you know, and it's a perfectly acceptable and credible, if rather not so creditable role <laughs> well, for we a won't... journalist to, uh, to be in, you know, yes, yes. and I mean, just as how I wished Andrew Morton well, and still do. I like Andrew Morton. He's a nice man. I don't know Omid Scobie. I've not ever had the experience of meeting him. But of his communications with my team, I would have said he certainly seems to be perfectly pleasant. Uh, and good luck to him. I hope he makes a vast amount of money on really what is a load of rubbish. You know, but Harry and Meghan asking me, I mean, that would have been a joke. I mean, we all know that Harry's not exactly Einstein, but really, I mean, minus 50 IQ, I hope he doesn't have it. <laughs> and certainly the fact that he didn't ask me would indicate to me that he knows enough to know that don't ask me such yes. stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for today and all of your answers and opinions. And... Uh, Keep watching us, write the comments and the questions, and would you like to say anything more? <laughs> Thank you very much for your questions. Keep them coming in. Maybe we could have one or two that don't, don't have anything to do with Diana, Harry, Meghan. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not discouraging you from asking those. 
but I would encourage you to ask one or two others as well and things that you find interesting that maybe you would like me to speak about. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And goodbye from the Queen Victoria's boudoir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Another room today, I'm afraid. Yes, or Queen Victoria's day. Well, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye.